Hello and welcome to Board Game Ninja. Today we will tell you the rather gruesome tale of Harrow County. Long ago a witch called Hester was hung, burned and buried under a tree. From that tree a baby was born, Emmy, and everyone expected her to turn into Hester, but she loves the town. Then one day Hester's siblings turn up and want to destroy Harrow County for what they did to their sister. Emmy, who has some magical powers of her own, stands up and does her best to save the town together with her band of protectors. You play as a member of one of these factions, aided by Haints, which are undead under your command. Harrow County is a one-on-one -on -one strategic combat game in which one side fights to save the town as the protectors and the other side tries to destroy the town as the family. A game takes around 45 minutes to an hour and is for 40 years and older. We look at the game as described in chapter 3 of the rulebook, which is the core game. Chapters 1 and 2 serve to teach you the game. But there's ultimately a lot more to Harrow County. After chapter 3 you can add a whole new faction, or you can even add Hester herself, expanding the rules to play with three players. All factions are highly asymmetrical, as you will see in this video. The goal of the game is to kill the haints of your opponent and rescue the townsfolk if you are the protector, or destroy buildings if you're part of the family. Each accomplishment gives you points. You need 7 points to win the game. First decide who plays the protectors and who plays the family. Choose one of the maps and place it in the middle of the table in such a way that one home is right in front of you and one home in front of the opponent. Now place the ability tokens on the map. There are four different abilities. Spawn, Move, Strengthen and Legend. Put one of each in the bag and shake them. Take one out and place one of these ability tokens on every yellow planes with the ability token icon. Take a second one from the bag and place one of these on the green forests. The third goes on the brown bogs hexes. And the last one will be placed on all teal wetland hexes. Now the board looks something like this. Place the scoreboard on one side with the score markers on zero and the spoon on the single hint. Place the four mason jars of your color on the board and place the buildings and the townsfolk on their track. Now you need to choose the legend you want to play. Each side can choose between three different legends, each with a different legendary ability. In this video we will use the standard legends, Levi and Emmy. Some legends have extra tokens to be used with their abilities. The standees of the legends start in the home on your side of the board, accompanied by three haints. Each player receives one wild token. Put the player board in front of you. Each faction also has its own legendary powers, which can be found on this track that slots into your legend board. Place the three barbed wire or path tokens on the protector legend track. The fourth token is available to the protectors from the start. Take the 12 red tactics cards and place them in your play area. You receive three cards in your hand. The protectors are ready to start playing. The family has a little more preparation to do. Take the blue bag and fill it with four move, two spawn and two strengthen tokens. The family shuffles the six upgrade cards and puts them in their play area, accompanied by the six upgrade ability tokens. You also start with three cards in hand. Now close the box again. Put it upright and place the battleground in line with the opening at the bottom of the tree. Each player puts three cubes of their color on the battleground. The last thing to do is decide who goes first. Shuffle the eight bonus tiles and take turns placing one open between two matching mason jar tokens. The player who places the first player token is the start player. Keep flipping open bonus tiles if you haven't found the first player token yet, after you've filled up the spaces between the mason jars. Shuffle the four bonus tiles not on the scoreboard and place them in a face down pile. You're ready to play Harrow County. At the start of the round each player places one of the objectives of the opponent on the map townsfolk or buildings. The first player takes an objective and looks at the ground type underneath. They place it on a matching hex, ideally on a space that is hard to reach for the opponent. Then the other player does the same. 
Each faction has a different goal and a different way to accomplish that goal. For the protectors to rescue the townsfolk, you need to guide them back to their homestead. You can move them by laying a trail of haint, path tokens and legends, through which you can move the townsfolk freely. In your homestead they are safe and you gain two points. Townsfolk cannot travel through the brambles. The family needs to make a trail of storms from their home ending on a building. When the two are connected, the building is destroyed and you add two points on the family score marker. At the end of each turn, your legend creates a storm at its current hex. Harrow County is played in rounds that consist of two phases. In the first phase, the players take turns activating mason jars for actions. After each player has activated three jars, go to phase two in which you hand out a brambles point and, if nobody has won yet, refresh the mason jars. Let's look at the first phase in which you use mason jars to do your actions. If there's a bonus tile on your column, you can take it and add the bonus action to your actions of that turn. The players take turns turning over the mason jars and performing their actions until both have activated three jars. There are different types of mason jars. What you get from the ability mason jar is different for each faction, but the actions are the same. How many actions you can take depends on your faction and the situation. The protector chooses one of the abilities on the faction board and looks at the number above the rightmost ability token. For instance, here you get three movement points. The family has a different mechanism. The number above the rightmost ability token indicates that you take five tokens out of the bag and return two. The three that you decide to keep are the actions you can perform this turn. There are four abilities in the game. Move, Spawn, Strengthen and Legend. Legend is controlled by the Legend Mason Jar that we will explain later. For one movement point, you pick one hex and take as many units as you like to the next hex. This is one move. If you have more, then this can be your second move and this your third. You receive the ability tokens on which you or your Haints end their turn. Please note that you cannot move onto a hex that is occupied by any of your opponent's units, including townsfolk and buildings. Moving onto a mountain takes one extra movement point. Also, if one of the protectors wants to move into a storm, it costs two points. What can you do with the ability tokens you receive? The protectors simply add the tokens to their faction board on the matching line or on the legend board. The next time you choose this ability, it has become stronger. The family needs to make a choice. At the end of their turn, they can decide to place the tokens on their faction board or put the tokens in their bag. By placing them on your board, the number of tokens you can pull from the bag grows fast. By putting them in the bag, you can manipulate which tokens you are likely to get. Maybe you have noticed the cards icons on the faction board. When you cover these with tokens, you take a card from your deck. The family's deck contains upgrades. Whenever they choose the ability mason jar, they can upgrade a token on the cards for a much stronger token. The protectors have tactics cards that can be played during your turn to give you various advantages. For one spawn point, you can place a haint on your homestead or on the hex of your legend. The maximum number of units in one space is four. For one strengthened point, you place a cube onto the battlefield. At the end of the turn, there can only be six cubes of your color on the battlefield. The wild mason jar is equal for all factions. If you choose this jar, you immediately gain one wild token. For every token that you have, you can perform one move, strengthen or spawn. You don't spend the token, so the jar gets more powerful over time. The Legend Mason Jar is different for each faction. It consists of two actions, one by your Legend and one by your faction. During the game, you pick up Legend tokens. These are placed on your Legend board and make the action stronger. Let's look at Emmy. When she performs her Legend action, she places a red cube on every hex that contains one of her Haints, but has no cubes yet. Whenever the family attacks the hex, this cube is immediately added to the battle. 
Furthermore, when Emmy moves around and encounters one of her cubes, she immediately places it on the battleground. The Protector's Legend action has to do with the Path or Barbed Wire tokens. When you receive a Legend token, you place it on your ward. Emmy received the token underneath. In your Legend action, you place these within two hexes from Emmy. You choose Barbed Wire face up, no one can enter that hex. Or Path face up, everyone can enter this space for one less movement point, even when not using a move action. Townsfolk can move over these hexes freely, as if a protector's unit was present. Now we look at Levi. His legend action is that each of his hands can move onto or off an adjacent hex that matches the terrain that Levi is occupying, as long as it's legal. These are all legal moves. The family's legend action becomes stronger as you collect more legend ability tokens. At the start of the game, you can place a storm on a hex occupied by one of your haints. When you have collected one legend token, you can also pull an ability token one step closer to the storm you've just created. At two tokens, you can pull one of your haints one step closer to the storm and in the ultimate step, you can pull also an enemy one step closer to the storm. Now let's check out the last remaining type of mason jar, the attack. You can attack with your legend or with your haints, and you can attack the legend or the haints of your opponent. First, you get a free move, spawn or strengthen action. You can use it now or later in this turn. Next, you declare which hex is going to attack where. Normally, the units have a range of two spaces. When they're in the mountains, it's three spaces. Determine who has the most units, and that side adds an extra cube to the battleground. Collect all the cubes on the battleground and feed them to the tree. What comes out at the bottom determines the outcome of the battle. You always attack Haints before you attack the legend. If the attacker has the same or higher number of cubes, you have the upper hand, but you need at least two cubes to complete the attack action. Return two cubes to the stock and remove the Haint from the hex. Most importantly, you get points. If there is anyone left on the hex and you still have the same or more cubes and you have more than two cubes, you may attack again. Put two more of your cubes in the stock and remove another haint. Again, you score points. When attacking a legend successfully, you don't remove it, but push it one hex away and then kill a haint anywhere on the board. When the tree yields more defender cubes than attacker cubes, the attack is unsuccessful. But you can initiate a haint clash if there are haints on both hexes. Pay the cost of two cubes to kill a haint, but now the defender can also pay two cubes to kill a haint of the attacker. Normally it costs two cubes to make an attack successful and to kill an opponent, but this is different when the defender is situated in the brambles in the center of the board. It is hard to defend yourself if you can't move around. To succeed at an attack on the brambles, you only need and discard one cube. Every time you kill a haint, you score. Look at the little wooden spoon on your score dial. At the start, it shows one haint, so when you kill your first haint, you score a point. A wooden spoon is turned one step clockwise, and now it costs two haints to score a point. Place haints you killed on the dial to keep track. When three mason jars have been activated on both sides, the round ends. It's time for phase two, cleanup. A Brambles point is awarded to the faction that occupies the center of the board. Add one point to your score marker. If one of the players makes it to seven points, the game is almost over. Finish the round and the player with the most points wins. Ties go to the player with the first player marker. If not, prepare the board for a new round. The first player marker changes sides, four new bonus tiles are added to the center of the scoreboard, and the other player starts a new round. Don't forget to add the objectives, townsfolk and building, to the map if there are still any left. Now on to activating your incredible mason jars again. Harrow County is an intense battle between two totally different opponents. Strategically, there are a great many paths that lead to victory. Every component that is added to the game increases the possibilities. 
We showed you the full game, but in the box there are many more components to add and each has its own impact on the game and the balance. We hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe to our channel and we will see you in another video. Bye!